Last week and this week, I've been doing kind of a, a miniature sermon series on what God is leading us to do at the start of Rejoice Christian Church, what's his vision for this church. But the way I'm going about that is by unpacking the word of God in key passages that have helped craft the vision for the new church. So last week we unpacked Philippians 3, Rejoice in the Lord. And this week we're going to continue in that. I'm going to unpack Psalm 67. So if you have a Bible, please go ahead and open it to Psalm chapter 67. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. The ushers are bringing Bibles down the aisle now. And if you use one of the church Bibles, the page numbers are up on the screen, so it's even easier to find your way around. The book of Psalms, where we're going to be today, is God's songbook. 150 different songs that God inspired uh, over 3,000 years ago. And just what a variety of songs. If you were to try and take the book of Psalms, and categorize them into, you know, these are prophetic psalms or these are psalms of praise. You would have a very difficult time categorizing these because they're all so unique. God inspired these psalms for different purposes. Um, This one is very unique in that it's considered the missionary psalm. Um, A lot of the psalms do give us a little bit of information about them. You can look at, there's usually a title above the psalm that says, you know, a psalm of David when he was being pursued by Absalom. And that can be really helpful. We can get the context. Why did God inspire this psalm like he did? And when you have the context, then you can study that psalm and you can say, when I'm going through seasons similar to what this psalm writer was going through. When I'm going through a a difficult time or when I'm looking to praise the Lord, then you could turn to that psalm and say, this resonates with me right now. But then sometimes you have a psalm like this one. It doesn't give you information. We don't know who wrote this psalm. We don't know why they wrote this psalm. And I believe that God gives us psalms like this for an important reason. This is a psalm for always. This is a psalm that is always important. This message, this text, it doesn't have a a season to empathize. This is for all people to hear. So we're going to unpack the missionary psalm here. It's seven short verses, so just follow along with me as I read Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Selah. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth, Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Let's just pray over that text. Lord, thank you for inspiring this text. Thank you, God, for giving us this missionary psalm. I pray, God, that you would align our hearts and minds with your intended purpose for this psalm right now. Help us, God, to be attentive to hear what you have to say to each of us individually. Lord, I pray that any competing thoughts or distractions that you've brought into our our lives that we're dealing with right now, God, help us to set those aside for the time of hearing your word. And I just pray, God, that we would be able to faithfully hear through the power of the Holy Spirit today. Pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have this psalm here. It's kind of written by one person. There's one voice. We don't have uh, a conversation per se, but I do believe that this psalm is a conversation of one person with God. And the reason I say that is if you look at the beginning half of the psalm and you look at the latter half of the psalm, you see that in the beginning, this psalmist is calling out things, praying and asking God for things. 
And in the second half, the psalmist is acknowledging that God is doing these things. So there's sort of a conversation happening here where the psalmist is seeing something change partway through to where God is revealing to him the answer to his prayers. And then I'm going to give you a word here that I had to look up. So if you already knew it, then good on you. Palindrome. Palindrome? I don't know. But a palindrome. So that's a word like race car or mom, or dad. It's a word that when you read it forward, or you read it backwards, it's the exact same word. And in poetry, you can write a song or a poem that follows the structure of a palindrome. And if you look at this psalm, what you see, and it's a pretty important structure, that's the only reason I'm telling you this, is how we're going to unpack it, is that this Psalm follows a very structured presentation of beginning and end. So if you look, verse 1, the psalmist prays, may God be gracious to us and bless us. And then the final verse, verse 7 says, God shall bless us. The second verse, that your way may be known on earth. And that aligns with verse 6, the earth has yielded its increase. And then verses 3 and 5 are the exact same verse repeated. So you see how the psalm follows this structure of sort of call and response. It mirrors itself. And what this does is emphasizes verse 4. So as we unpack this, you're going to see that there is a right way, I think, to read this psalm. And it's to start from the outside and unwrap it and work our way to this peak of the crescendo in the center of the psalm in verse 4. This song was deliberately structured this way, so we'll follow God's leading in that, and we're going to begin in verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And if a song is a prayer, is there a better way to start a prayer than may God be gracious to us and bless us? If God is who he says he is, who he has revealed himself to be, then God is the creator of all things. If you look to the mountains that God has created, you're gonna see in there not just a vast beauty of shape and form that you can see from a distance, but as you get up close, every shade and color of mineral, glaciers, rivers, trees, everything that exists in these beautiful mountains that God created. They even got a little bit nicer because they got snow on them this week for just a little bit and it got me really excited for for skiing. It's coming. And God made these beautiful things. They're his. And he's the same creator God who makes the most minute, intestinally small, infinitesimally small, not intestinally small, detail Every generation has their group of scientists who says, we finally found the smallest thing possible, right? First it was the cell, then it was the atom. Now we're at the subatomic level. And guess what's gonna happen for my kids and my grandkids and every generation until Jesus comes back is that governments will keep giving billions of dollars to scientists. They'll build a new machine. They'll crash something together and they're gonna find, guess what? God built it even smaller. You're gonna keep looking and you're gonna keep finding God is in the details. This is the creator God. He owns all of these things. Everything is under his control. So to whom should we look for blessing? To our own effort, to our government? To the God who has created and sovereignly controls all things. May God graciously bless us. That is the appropriate start of a prayer. And it continues in verse 1. God doesn't just stop inspiring this prayer with, may God be gracious to us and bless us. The psalmist here is encouraged by the Spirit of God to ask for something so great that no human in existence deserves to ask for. The request given in all of Psalm 67.1 is about as audacious of a prayer as you could put forward. The scale and the size difference between the asker and the asked are so vast that it seems 
inappropriate to even ask of the Lord to have him make his face shine upon us. Think of like an elementary school drama club going to Broadway and asking for the greatest star to come and star in the school musical. And as demeaning as that might seem, a sinful human asking the God of the universe to make his face shine upon us. And yet, God doesn't just condescend himself to do it, and he does. He inspired people to pray this prayer. This was the leading of God to have us pray, God, have your face shine upon us. It was God who inspired the original form of this in Numbers chapter six. In number six, God is giving Moses this prayer that Moses is to tell Aaron And Aaron is supposed to pray as the priest over Israel. He's supposed to pray this over God's people. And in Numbers 6.25, Aaron is to pray, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The guy who prayed that was the guy who built the golden calf. God condescends himself to give us this prayer, to let us call out to him. We've got this audacious prayer. And what makes it so audacious? What's the big deal about God shining his face upon us? Does God even have a face to shine at us? And no, God doesn't have a face like we have a face. God is spirit. But what would it mean for one of us to shine our face upon somebody else? And the face does not hide emotion, right? When somebody is pleased with somebody else, I even think of like my rascal kids sometimes, when they, they do something that they know is naughty, but it was really cute the way they did it. You parents know what I'm talking about, and you're like trying to get onto your kid, but your face deceives you. You're like, I'm really happy you did that. That was funny. It's because your face cannot hide the delight that you have in somebody, right? That's when your face shines upon somebody. And what the psalmist is asking for here is for God to shine his face upon sinful man, to delight in us. Do we even merit the freedom to ask that, nonetheless to receive that from God. And I'd say, hold on to that question. Hold on to that tension that exists in this psalm as we have the asking side of the psalm and the answering side of the psalm all hinging on verse four. And in keeping with unpackaging the psalm from the outside in, look with me at verse seven. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So what we saw in verse one was this vague, uncertain prayer. God, will you do this? We saw, God, will you bless us? Will you shine your face upon us? So we have this this asking of a very vague thing to receive from God. And we get the answer sort of in verse seven. We don't get the mechanics as to how how God will do it, but we do get an answer that God will look at someone with delight. We don't know who God will bless. We don't know if the blessing will be physical material Will it be health? Will it be a spiritual blessing? We don't know if the blessing will come in this life or the next. All we know through this psalm so far as we go through the building up the crescendo, the only resolution we have is that God will bless someone. It's vague. And the rest of verse seven gives a little bit of context. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So this blessing that's asked for and that is somewhat promised here by God is for all the ends of the earth. So now we at least know that God's saying, I'm going to bless people, all of them. And we also get that this blessing involves fearing the Lord. 
And fearing the Lord is this thing that's all over scripture. You can see that the beginning of wisdom is in fearing the Lord. It's a good thing. So how is it a good thing to fear the Lord? And the answer is that to fear something, you have to first know about that thing. If you don't know about something, you can't fear it. So in order to ever fear God, you have to first know about God. And what happens is when you set your eyes on God, when he reveals himself some way to you, and that's different for all of us, is that when God reveals himself and you catch a glimpse of just a little bit of his size, his goodness, his glory, his majesty, it'll give you a similar feeling as being near the precipice of a massive cliff. The cliff is only dangerous if you were to go off the edge, but you don't even want to get too close to the edge because it's fearsome. It's called reverence. To know God is to revere God. So the fear of the Lord is a good thing, and God is promising this. Let the ends of the earth fear him. God is starting to get to the heart of this psalm in that The psalmist is talking about the nations knowing God. So they can fear God because they can know him. So that's an implication here. So the psalmist begins the prayer with a prayer for God to bless and show affection towards people. And this audacious prayer is answered somewhat with an affirmative that involves knowing and fearing the Lord all over the earth. And then we'll continue to unwrap this psalm by then looking to verse two. That your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. So as verse one was a request and verse seven was a corresponding answer, we're back at the requesting side of the psalm. And now the psalmist is being more specific in what they're asking for. The psalmist started by asking for God to shine his face upon humanity, and God will give that blessing and grant the fear of the Lord to all the earth, and then the psalmist asked God, make your way known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. And what is the psalmist asking for now? He's, he's admitting something. It isn't enough to just know that God exists. So we have in passages like Romans 1, 19 and 20, that God shows us that all of creation points to the existence of God. Our conscience points to the existence of God. That it's not enough for people to just know that God exists. You could go and ask any people from around the world in any culture, does God exist? And in their own way, they're going to have to admit, yes, there is something out there that's greater than us. There is a creator God that does exist. Now, I know that sometimes in our culture, we have the, the fools who say that there is no God. And scripture tells us only the fool says in his heart that there is no God. But the psalmist here is calling out to God and praying, don't just reveal that you exist. God, show the world, show the nations your way, your saving way. So now we're getting more specific in the ask. And what a great prayer of compassion, right? Any of us who know God, any of us who have been affected by the gospel, we know that You need Jesus' saving work to have any chance of having a healthy relationship with God, to have forgiveness for the sins that are, you know, rightly ours, the condemnation that's rightly ours. So if you know Jesus, you know his gospel, it should be a desire in your heart that other people would also know Jesus, that other people would also have the opportunity to surrender to him. So this is a compassionate prayer, one that should be a prayer on our lips, that we should sing the song of Psalm 67, and that when we do that, we are praying, God, we know this is your want and ours because you inspired it. Show your saving work to the nations. 
And what is the response in verse 6? The mirror in verse 6. Psalmist says, The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. And this is admittedly, just that first reading, the most confusing of the passages. I'm grateful that God structured the psalm this way so that we can have some context to understand what does he mean by making this agricultural reference about the earth yielding its increase. And I think it's really important that if we're going to understand this, we look at a key term in verse 2. The prayer was that God would reveal his saving way among all what? Nations. And we have to shed some light here because we have to shed some of our cultural baggage that helps us, that interferes with our ability to understand what's happening. A nation is not a political boundary with a government. It doesn't matter if there's a mountain on one side, a river on the other, and it fits well on a map, and then we put a government over that. That is not what the Bible means by a nation. The Hebrew word is kind of vague, but if you look at the the way that the Greek Old Testament, um, the way that they wrote this word, they used a word that I think helps us in our culture, in our language, understand what the Bible means by nation. The Greek word used is ethnos. What does that sound like in our language? Ethnicity. So what is a nation if it's not a boundary with a political governance over it. A nation is a group of people that share a culture and a language. And that's how the Bible views nations, and that's how we, when we're reading the word of God, need to understand what God is talking about, is a nation is this shared values of culture and language. So when we focus our attention now back at verse six, We see now why this agricultural reference about the earth yielding its fruit connects with the rest of the message. See, God designed this world to be filled with his image bearers. We're pretty good at it, right? We're pretty good at multiplying. And his image bearers have spread throughout the world. And as they've spread, they've become varied. You see a difference from one culture to another culture. And what's the purpose of humanity? We are the image bearers of God. We're supposed to point to God. God is not simple. There is an inherent diversity in the person of God. He fits more colors. He fits more cultures. He fits more languages. So in order for God's earth to yield its increase, people had to spread and become varied. And we see that there is a diversity. There's a beautiful diversity that will be represented in heaven someday when all the nations are gathered and singing praise to him and every culture and every tongue is represented. And it's a beautiful thing. The earth has yielded its increase. And then the psalmist concludes verse six with God, our God shall bless us. So it's again kind of a vague response. It's now more a specific prayer that God would reveal his saving work among the nations. And by God saying that he shall bless us, we can assume that God is responding by saying that he's going to do it. But I think there's something else that's just a beautiful thing happening in verse six. God gives us a very intimate posture with him in this verse. As God inspired this text, he permitted and encouraged us to not just call him God, but God, our God. We get to use a possessive of God. We get to claim him as his own, even though we are his possession. That is an intimate term that we get to call out to God. When we sing songs about our God, my God, just know, God doesn't just give you permission. He's telling you to pray this yourself. Sing the song to our God. 
And then as we continue to build up, as we creep inward on this psalm, we see verses three and five, which become this chant of begging for delight. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the peoples praise you. And this ask is so built up in this crescendo and in this psalmist's heart that he isn't satisfied to just say, let the peoples praise you one time or even two times, but four times in this little section here, he says, let the peoples praise you. And what does it mean to praise? To praise God is to, like that, to praise God by yelling. I I taught those kids that. (laughs) To praise God is to see him to see him at work. It's to catch a glimpse of his glory in some way that he chooses to reveal it. And what happens when you see him is you can't help but well up with joy for delighting. That's God. And when you do, the overflow will come out of your mouth somehow and you will Praise God. And this psalmist is obviously intimate with this sensation of praising God. He knows how to praise God himself. And he's got this great prayer. Lord, let the nations praise you. And what's he really asking for there? He's saying, God, reveal yourself to the nations in a way that they can be alive in their hearts, that they can perceive what you're doing, who you are, and when they perceive it, make them alive so that they can have the overflow and the outpouring of praise. The psalmist is asking for God to save the nations. That's his heart cry in verse 3. And in this beautiful psalm, this palindrome that goes back and forth with a call and response, we then get to go from verse three and whatever's affecting it in verse four, which we'll get to, we're building there. But then we get verse five, the response, and the response to verse three is a repetition. Let the nations praise you. Why is that consequential? And it's because if this psalm is a calling out and asking and then a responding with some sort of resolution, what we see is that in verse three, the psalmist is asking, God, let the nations praise. And then verse five is the fulfillment, not emphasizing the let them praise in the sense that they could ever praise at all, but let them praise because they're rejoicing in you, they're delighting in you, they know who you are already and you continue to reveal yourself to them. It's the same thing that I could pray for any one of my brothers or sisters in Christ. When I say let this person praise you, I'm saying they already know who you are, God, but continue to show yourself to them in power. Let them praise you. And only God can do this, where he can structure this psalm in a way so that he can have an asking and a fulfilling that are the exact same phrase, each of them have different meaning, and both of them are powerful. Only God can inspire a text like this. Let the peoples praise you. And then we get to move on to the main event here. The focus of this psalm is at the heart of the arrangement, the center of the palindrome. Verse four, it's the only stanza with three lines. It's the longest and the one deserving of the most attention. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. And as we unpack this key verse here of the psalm, we need to start with that profound statement. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. What's happening in this phrase is that the psalmist and God who inspired the psalmist is acknowledging they are not glad now. These nations lack 
joy and gladness because they do not yet have an intimacy with the living God. The world lacks a saving knowledge of God and God is the only worthwhile source of gladness and joy and therefore there is a pandemic worse than any virus. There is a cancer worse than anything that affects the flesh. There's an absence of worship in the Lord. God's own image bearer, his people are unable to fulfill their purpose until God reveals himself to them. Humanity cannot truly rejoice without delighting in God. And what makes these words so powerful is that the psalmist isn't just speaking about this awful condition of lack of joy, this godless joylessness. He's not just talking about people who are separated from Jesus. He's talking about entire nations of people. Here in our own city, we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are not delighting in God. That's true. But God here is inspiring this psalm about nations of people who do not delight in him. And I'm going to give a visual here. What I've got here is a list of languages in the world. I saw this at Vacation Bible School, and it was really powerful. This is a list of languages in the world that do not yet have the Bible in their own native heart language. So what's a heart language? A heart language is the language that you dream in. The language that you solve complex problems in. The language you speak with your grandmother. That's your heart language. And that really matters because if you only hear about God in some foreign language, that God does not seem real to you. And what we have on this list, like I said, it's these list of languages and next to it, we have the population of people who speak that. And you guys can't see it, so I'm just gonna make up numbers. No, I'll tell you a few of them. One of them's got 240,000. One of them's only got 900, and then there's another that's got half a million. You're talking about a lot of people. In fact, it's not just this one page. This list in 12-point font is over 1,500, I can't even get this thing out, it's so heavy with, just keep going, we're gonna run out of stage. This blew my mind the first time I saw it. Every single one of the lines on this page represents a nation of people who do not have the Bible in their native tongue. 1.5 billion people represented on this page strung out over the stage. It's a big deal. It matters to God. And that's why God inspired this text in the first place. There are big problems in this world. We need someone to someday cure cancer. We need that. We need people to commit their lives to feeding the hungry and to getting clean water to people who don't have access to clean water. These things are important. But today, we could cure every single disease known to man and feed and get clean water to every single person on the planet. And if we can't resolve this, this list of peoples who don't have access to God in their language, it's all for naught because it's a group of people who will not yet experience the gladness, the joy of intimacy with their creator God whom they were created to worship. It's a big deal. Now verse four doesn't say we all need to band together and solve this problem of joyless, godless people. 
It says, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. The verse makes it clear that God is the one who needs to let the nations hear of him. That God is the one who needs to reveal himself to the nations. Our starting point is not to go out and do something. Our starting point is to speak to the God who can do something. But also, in this key verse to the missionary psalm, the psalmist acknowledges that God judges the people with equity and guides the nations upon the earth. So what does it mean that God judges with equity? Equity means something that's just and fair. And this just and fair God will judge the world. He will judge sin and he will condemn all those who remain in their sin. So how do these two concepts link? How do we both see a God who judges fairly and condemns sin and simultaneously reaches the nations? How does God judge with equity and save the nations at the same time? Where could we look to to find both grace and perfect justice? And the linchpin of this verse is the linchpin for everything that we could ever contemplate. Jesus Christ and his gospel and his ministry and what he accomplished on the cross by taking the condemnation and the wrath of God upon himself and offering his righteousness freely to all who would surrender to him is the answer to the problem in the missionary psalm. Jesus is the reason that verses one through three can be a psalmist asking God, please make your saving way known on the earth. And then we can have the last half of the psalm that says, I will bless my people. It all hangs on Jesus and what he has already done. We even asked at the start of this psalm, do we merit such a blessing as having God shine his face upon us? And the answer is no. But if Jesus has become our righteousness for us, then absolutely. Because God shining his face upon me is not because of anything I've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. He is the answer. Because of his gospel, there is hope in the world for 1.5 billion people. And there is hope in the world for us. So what though? Do we just sit on our hands and wait for Jesus to come and save all the nations. I do want to draw your attention to at least two other passages that I think each of them could merit their own sermon series, but just to make sure that we're wrapping up the idea of what God gave us in Psalm 67, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24, 14. So, We're kind of familiar with this. Recently, Brad's been preaching about end times. And this passage is in the middle of Jesus speaking to his disciples about end times. It's a passage called the Olivet Discourse. And this is where Jesus is in the olive grove speaking to his disciples about what's going to happen at the end about his return. And Jesus himself tells us, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. If you believe that Jesus is coming back again someday, then you got to give an amen to Jesus' words there. Amen and amen. I desire for Jesus to return. And he tells us right here in this passage what we're waiting on. Jesus said, my gospel is going to all the nations and then the end will will come. Now, does that answer our problem? Does that mean we just wait for Jesus to get the gospel out to all the nations? We do need to turn to one more place that I think informs us in this, and that's 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter 3.12. So this is in the midst of a passage where Peter, 
is talking about the return of Jesus and how when he comes back, the old heavens and the old earth will pass away. They'll be dissolved and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We have a hope in a future that is to come. And amidst that, in verses 11 and 12, I'm just gonna read the beginning of verse 12. Peter is talking about what we should do, how we ought to live while we're waiting for Jesus to come back again. And Peter says, waiting for, and church, what's that next word? Hastening the coming of the day of God. There is a posture of waiting for the return of Jesus that hastens, quickens, accelerates the return of Jesus. If what we're waiting for is for the whole community of the elect to be gathered, if what we're waiting for is for the nations to hear the gospel of Jesus, how on earth do we hasten the return of Jesus? And the answer is to get the gospel to the nations. This is so important. It's important to Jesus. It's important to Peter. It's important to the Holy Spirit who inspired Psalm 67. And if we care about the people who do not yet have the gospel, and if we care about the return of Jesus, then guess what we care about? Reaching these people. And why is it so difficult? It's difficult because these people live in difficult to reach places. They live in hot places, and I get it. Nobody wants to live in a hot place. I certainly don't. That's how hell is described, as a hot place. And they speak different languages than us. They don't even speak American in some of these places. And they have different cultures that do things that you might take offense to. And our job is to not go and change their culture. Our job is to show the gospel of Jesus to all people. And when all the nations hear of Jesus, they will be affected. And Jesus will begin to gather up the full measure of his fold. And when the fold is gathered, then the day of the Lord will be upon us. This is amazing truth. Church, I want to pray over this truth right now. Lord God, help us to care about every single soul on this planet who does not yet know you as their Lord. Lord, help us to have compassion like you gave to this psalmist who was full of compassion for his fellow man. God, help us to not just prioritize our own culture in our own nation. Help us to care about the people who do not yet have clear, obvious access to you in their own language. God, help us to see what your calling is for each and every one of us as individuals because, Lord, we all have a different role in this. And at your leading, God, we can know how we have a role in seeing your kingdom grown to all the nations of the earth. God, for individuals who are here who have never yet experienced the joy, they don't know what being glad is like because they've never had a closeness with you, Lord, I pray that those people would be called to life right now and would surrender to your gospel, experience the joy of knowing the one true living God. And as they have that gladness, you would also appoint in them a desire to see others find you. Lord, I ask all this in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen.